of the PGI and uh, honorable chairman and friends. I'm going to talk about a relatively unpleasant situation where the surgeon believes bad things can't happen to him and hopes that they don't happen to him. I'm going to talk of a situation where an infected joint is infected and infected and infected, operated and operated and operated where to go. Now, the aim is to eradicate sepsis, get pain relief and maintain function. There are many ways uh, intervention besides medical suppressive treatment. We all know of arthroscopy, open debrima, single, two-stage, sometimes repeated debrima. And I'm going to really focus on the last three, arthrodesis, resection, and amputation, which most of us think will never happen to us. But believe me, lightning strikes when it is least expected. Now, reinfection after stage revision arthroplasty is a major challenge. That is infection after you have done something. And risk is there because of mixed flora. These days we've been hearing about it. You get nothing on the cultures very often. We just heard about MRSA. And there's high comorbidity index we just heard in the previous talk. And previous failed attempts at trying to save the joint. The options that we are going to discuss, the other options of single dual stage is going to come in the next talks, I believe, but the options I'm going to talk is when those are not an option. One is to try and save this. The other is resection, then arthrodesis and amputation. I just want to bring you up to date that if you have to do these, where do we stand today? The prolonged suppressive antibiotic therapy is to be used with limited indications and most important when you can't really operate the patient for very difficult medical conditions or the patient is unwilling to be operated again and you have exhausted all other surgical methods. The antibiotic combinations, it's a chapter on its own, but I just want you to go back and read a little bit more about adding rifampicin. This seems to be the flavor these days. If you're keeping patients for long term on antibiotics, it is believed that it is of great value. But let me now talk of what happens and when you do these kind of operations. The first one I'm going to talk about is resection arthroplasty or girdle stone. Most of the people here would have grown up hearing about this in India at least, and this was described initially for tuberculosis of hip by girdle stone in 1930s. The present day indications for this kind of an operation are there is severe bone loss where you cannot actually put the metalwork in. There is high risk of recurrent infection if you did put the metal work in. And the patient with severe comorbidities and you want to just go in and come out and not hope that you have to go in back again. However, on the knee side, this has not proven to be a comfortable operation and the results have been bad universally and it is hardly practiced. On the hip, it is still an option. Now, factors which affect the outcome on the hip side are very elderly patients, the diabetics, patients with multiple comorbidities, osteoarthritis of the other hip. If you have the other hip, which is very painful, it's going to be very difficult to ambulate after a girdle stone. And if you're doing a girdle stone and you leave back cement like this, in an infection, you are as good as having not operated because the infection is unlikely to be eradicated. Now, the next step comes arthrodesis. Arthrodesis, the indications are poor condition of the patient, patient with severe extensor mechanism loss in the knee, poor quality of soft tissue. That even if you put the joint, it's not going to be able to motorize the joint. You won't be able to use it very virulent organisms and patients on whom second stage revision arthroplasty has failed repeatedly and last but not the least the cost of going in again and again into a patient. In contrast to resection arthroplasty, arthrodesis offers more predictable outcomes and better function in the knee as compared to the hip. Arthrodesis, you can see, of the hip is gradually going out of uh, favor gradually because largely you'll see many papers have come to say that the big, bigger problem is that the patient have back pain because of a stiff hip if it is not perfect and there are also issues with dysfunction of the joint uh, 
particularly for sexual functions. 80% people reported in the study unhappiness with arthrodesis. Whereas the knee arthrodesis has proven to be functionally better than the hip arthrodesis and in a recent systemic review, arthrodesis has proven as a treatment of choice as in the paper below in cases where you can do nothing. Now, you can fuse the knee with the intramedullary nailing, external fixation, plating, but since there is a report of these cannulated screws, these are hardly ever used, but for completion's sake, after you do these, you tend to put them in plaster for the rest of their lives. It takes very long. Nonetheless, intramedullary nailing, it's something like doing it. You can choose to do it straight in one stage if you feel it's clean enough or do it like a two-stage, clean it up. And there has been a report of 83% success rate in 2006 with fusion with intramedullary nailing. And this nailing also can be of many types. You can have an arthrodesis with the usual nail. You can customize a nail. You can use a modular nail, you can use a huck step nail where you can actually lock it above and below with multiple screws. And you can have a curved kuncha nail to go back in, into the three point fixation where you feel it is stable, but it is doubtful. However, these are the ways you can stabilize. The people who can use external fixators well will swear by them and the egg the, the fixation with the use of Elizirov certainly has some benefits. If you can eradicate it, you can also gain some length. Typically, when you fuse your uh, uh, knee after removing the implant, you're going to have a fair amount of shortening, which can run into five to eight centimeters at time. So if you're good at Elizirov, you have an option. And then there are the other ways you can use different fixators, yeah, I mean, all, all kinds, whichever you are comfortable with. So you have had various papers which show that there is no significant difference with intramedullary nail or external fixators, and there is functional outcome scores and leg length discrepancies which are seen differently with different methods. Certainly one way of getting bone and leg length equality has been reported as Elizirov technique. Now the results, we see that eradication of infection with external fixators has been reported in literature from 82% to a slightly unbelievable 100%. With intramedullary nail, of course there are people who always get 100% result, but we will go for the lower side, 71%. Dual plating, 85%. And surprisingly, the report on cannulated screw, somebody reported 100%. I purposely kept him out of this quoting uh, uh, because I don't want anybody to carry away the impression that this is the way to fuse the knee. Complications are recurrence of infection or failure of union in all possible ways, but uh, there is one way which cannulated screws seem to be working best in literature. This just shows that you can't believe a single report, but, the, but nonetheless, there is a reinfection in most of the ways that you fuse it and more important is what a clean environment you have when you fuse it with the way that you are best and your team is best apt at. Finally, when you think that you've tried everything and uh, you've failed at resection, you've failed at arthrodesis, there is severe bone loss, there is necrotizing fasciitis, soft tissue defects cannot be closed and patient is going into septicemia, Friends, this is something we should look at as the last resort with all humility that any surgeon should think. You know, we all think this can't happen to us, it can happen to anybody. Amputation, the incidence in literature is 0.03% to 0.18% and that is the reason we believe that every time we get into our car or we get into an aircraft, we will reach home safely. But there are people, we all know what happens sometimes. So this is very, very rare. Incidence of aircraft problems or uh, accidents is lower than this. But it's just that this happens to one man. So surgeons are hesitant to perform this particular operation because it brings discomfort to the patient to the surgeon and his reputation. But sometimes it's important for saving his life. So the difference now between the amputation and arthrodesis, earlier we had compa uh, compared resection with arthrodesis, so now arthrodesis versus, uh, versus uh, amputation, you see mortality is much higher in amputations. 
because more often than not they are septicemic. They are already on the way to difficulty. The major complications are almost similar. The recurrence of infection is uh, also seen in above knee amputations again and therefore it is recommended even in this that you might do a guillotine and go on to close on the second stage when things look clean. Functional all outcome and quality of life is significantly better in the above knee amputation than the arthrotesis group. I'll tell you why. That is because of the more modern prostheses that are available today. And the prostheses can be the simple ones which most of our patients can afford. They give them dignity, they give them mobility. But those who can afford more, there are ones which are available with microprocessors, etc. And this is an art which is improving by the day and is giving, you know about the blade runners and things like that. People are actually running races. So, it's not to suggest that this should be the treatment for everybody, but if it happens, there are options. And finally, post-op infection in arthrodesis is still seen in 14.5%. And, percent. and uh, in uh, above knee amputations, there is on the margins of the skin rather than actually opening up. Uh, so we really need to go back even in above knee amputations if they are not healthy enough. Blood transfusion is needed in half the patients in both the surgeries roughly. Systematic complications in arthrodesis and above knee amputations, slightly more in above knee because I did say there are more unwell patients who need this. And hospital mortality, again, both of these show mortality. It's terribly scary. But you can imagine somebody came for simply a knee replacement and he ends up uh, not being there one day. It's a very troubling thought. So the sobering thought, which is very well put in this paper, has recommended that after a minimum, maximum or minimum of six failed limb salvage procedures, the idea of an above knee amputation over any further salvage procedure should be discussed with the patient and his family. Talking about preferably if you're going to do this, it's a fair idea to introduce him to what's going to happen to him later on. It is going to happen so very rarely that even you are not prepared for this eventuality. And they concluded that an arthroplasty should consider an amputation in a chronically infected prosthetic joint in a patient with multiple comorbidities who has failed multiple attempts of limb salvage surgeries and a soft tissue compromise. Last but not the least, you need to be together, you need to be supportive, you need to be talking both with the patient, his family, documenting all this properly and accepting the fact that it can happen to anybody, and least of all to you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Please come here.